Buddy, aren't we Minnesotans a hearty group? <laughs> yeah, I hope so. We're, we're very honored to have you. And I'm Chuck Weger. I'm the state senator for our area. And I'm going to be a teacher. And I'm going to have a couple of opening remarks. And then, if it's OK, we're going to have each of you identify yourself, if you want, or you can just pass. And in 10 seconds, you can say anything else in addition to your name, if you would like. And then we'll go, and after some comments additionally on some topics, we'll ask anyone if they'd like to offer us some input on a particular issue, a, a question, et cetera. And if we don't have the answer here, we promise to get back to you. Uh, with as uh, reasonable amount of time as possible. So, uh, I have been uh, the state senator for this area in the recent redistricting for the past few years, and the biggest thing that's happening right now is that we're going to be going into session February 20th. And number one responsibility is to make sure we have a balanced budget, okay, and that's important for all of us in our homes, etc. And that was what we did actually last session. But we will re-examine again to make sure we're on pace. We did get an uh, estimate, and they're called projections, it's required. And it said that we have a projected 188 million, I believe, shortfall. However, it will be adjusted again next month. and. Who knows, with the holiday sales <coughs> and a bunch of other activity that's happening that's been rather robust, it could be a, a better picture. So making sure we have the balanced budget, which is a requirement in our Constitution, will be priority one. And then beyond that, we'll look at a bonding bill, which is going to any number of projects, like Century College, or it could be for a trail to help finish a trail to go around White Bear Lake, something that we're working on, and many other items as well. So those are just you know, a couple of quick items. And you know, we're state legislators. I know there's a lot of discussion at the federal level, of course, with the tax bill that just passed. Are there implications for our budget on the federal tax bill? Absolutely. Uh, they didn't even have a committee hearing at the federal level. So the full impact is still being reviewed in our uh, legislature as well as throughout the country. But there will be impacts as it relates to funding because we base our budget on assumptions for revenue uh, and expectations and there will be an impact, but that's to be determined. So those are a couple of quick comments and now go to my colleague. Peter Fisher, and then we're just going to go around the room and open it up. Thank you, Senator Weger. First of all, welcome everyone to be being here today. This is great to see such a large crowd out here at Montemita. I don't ever recall seeing a, a crowd this large uh, when we've had a town hall meeting out here. So thank you all so much for taking the time to come out here, particularly on this cold morning. As Senator Weger referred to, there's a lot of work that we've got coming up in the upcoming session. Besides making the uh, budget balance, it's more of a policy session. That's why it's a little bit shorter. That's why we don't go into uh, session until February. And it's kind of reviewing policy to see what's working in the state, what isn't, and tweaking things that need to be tweaked. Hopefully there isn't anything too damaging that will occur as we go forward. I do know that the things that I've heard from many people in the area of concerns on have been making sure that we're protecting our environment, uh, keeping an eye as to what is happening in those areas, helping make sure that we're taking care of our smaller cities, I know that we've worked uh, very closely with some smaller cities in the area to help address issues about water, being able to reuse water easier for storm water, et cetera. And those are the kind of things that we continue to do that both Senator and I, uh, Weger and I, is keeping in touch not only with yourselves, but also with the leaders of our small communities here, uh, Birchwood, White Bear Lake, uh, Maplewood, so that we can get the feedback from them also because they do all the real hard work on the ground. We want to make sure that we've got policies that are not impeding what they're doing and giving them the tools that they need to be able to more effectively meet the needs in your local communities. So with that, I want to thank everyone for being here and we can get on with the introductions. Thanks. Um, and we're going to ask you if you'd like to go first. Okay. And, uh, and let's try to project uh, to the extent we can. And we are being uh, taped as well. And, I, and, uh, and if you have an objection to being on tape, let me give that. 
You probably, <laughs> they won't, know. You probably won't be on tape for most of the audience. Okay, okay, got it. Thank okay. you. I guess you're interested in what we have to say, too. So. <laughs> okay, tracking. Here we go. Uh, I'm Ron Austin. I live in Matamidae. Thanks. I'm Paulette Breezy, and I live at the far west end of Maplewood. And I've never been to a town hall meeting before, so that's why I'm here, is to um, explore what this is all about. Mm -hmm. My name is Bruce Breezy, the worst half of the <laughs> <laughs> this pair. Um, I also live in the western part of Maplewood. And I've been to a town hall meeting one other time. Thanks. My name is Jessica Ellison, and I live in Birchwood. Uh, and and Jessica is a newly elected school member board. for the White Bear School Board. Now sworn in on Monday. So. Oh. Uh, almost. Yeah, almost. almost. Oh, I'm sorry. Fellow school board Good morning. I'm Joyce Coleman. I work for Century College. And I apologize. I've got to leave 10 minutes over. I've got St. Paul Police Department. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Good. Thanks. My name is John Gagne. I live um, on Ridgeway up on top of the hill. My concerns are uh, transportation. How much salt is getting thrown around because the environment is another concern of mine. My name is Michael Lean, and I live in Birchwood, and I am uh, very interested in finding out if we can expect any action on payday lending this session. Mm -hmm. I'm Tori Dahl Whiskey, and I'm in White Bear Lake, and I just wanted to get up to date and go over that. Thank you. Paul Kadera, and I live in London. Good morning. Lucy Payne, Monterey High School Board. Kevin Donovan, Monterey High School Board. School boards are here. Good morning. I'm Carol Bufton from Monterey. I live on Victor Lane. And I'm interested in um, learning a little bit more about what you're doing in distracted driving and also about how we can make our government function more effective. Little stuff. Hard <laughs> parts, white your legs. Ron Edmund, uh, Maplewood. I'm Mary Haney. I'm a retired postmaster, but also retired from the Department of Revenue, Minnesota. Oh. <laughs> when I was there, we implemented FAST uh, Gen Tax program, <coughs> and it was seamless, it was smooth. So I would like to have some information, feedback from you about what happened with DOT. <laughs> That's the pair of public safety. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I worked for DOT for 40 plus years. It's just a mess. I mean, we when we were at Department of Revenue, we, we worked on it, did beta testing, and checked it six ways to Sunday before we implemented it. And I, I just can't believe that happened this time. I was frustrated with that. There's more happening going on. Hey, work. Mary Lee Abrams, Maplewood City Council. Joe Emerson, White Bear Lake Mayor. Um, Ellen Richter, City Manager for White Bear Lake. Lori Berg from Maplewood, and uh, my concerns are about the most vulnerable members of the community, and I want to thank you for your good work in uh, looking out for those people. My name is Lisa Borg, and I live in Monomedi. Kelly Snyder, Monomedi. Mary yes. Hauser, Birchwood. Former Metropolitan Council member, yes. among many oh, other yeah. things. Still good memory, Mark. <laughs> well, I served on the Metro Council with Mary. It's been a while. So. You know, I'm going to uh, Scott Snyder from Montevideo. Terry Scroble, White Bear Lake. Terry Colonna, Minnesota State College faculty, Century College. Scott Wagner, new to the uh, Maplewood um, neighborhood, interested in the uh, uh, Health and Human Services budget. Uh, Jeff Letterman, Monomi Guy, and I was just sworn in on Tuesday so to the Monomi Guy City Council. My nameplate's still up there, so that's good. <laughs> 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 uh, I'm Pam Letterman from Monomi Guy. We're going to ask this White Bear Lake. Thank you. Brian Hall, White Bear Lake. Uh, Stan Karwaski, I'm the Washington County Commissioner, and I represent a good portion of uh, Monomi and um, District 2. Um, I follow uh, Mary Hauser, so it's an honor to follow her as a county commissioner. So I'm here to uh, learn and listen. Um, I also represent a small section of White Bear Lake that uh, Joe Emerson on the air is uh, here. Also represent uh, Willardy, uh, Birchwood, uh, uh, and uh, uh, 
Birchwood Village and, and um, Pine Springs would be the areas up this way. So, thank you. Angelia Millender, president of Century College. I'm here to represent the great institution of Century. Thank you, faculty. Thank you, Joyce, and everyone else for being there. Clearly, we have an interest in this community, and we are an education engine as part of it. Judd Marshall, Montanita Mayor, I'm just here to make sure that everything stays cool. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Stevens, Matamidae. <laughs> uh, I'm Dallas Pearson. Uh, I'm from the North Star Oasis television show. And for those of you who have not seen a town hall before, if you go to YouTube slash North Star Oasis, you can see many of the town halls from the past in the entire time, the entire show. Thanks, Dallas. Um, Bill Kempe, Maplewood. Oh, the good morning. Uh, Dave Benamadavita, I appreciate your support for Lake Lake. This is a project. Nice work for you. Oh, Nancy Livingston, I'm a school board member at North St. Paul, Maplewood, Oakdale, and I also work for Senator Beaker. Yeah, I'm Spencer Cross, and I'm uh, representing Fisher as a legislative assistant. Good. Awesome. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, a variety of items. Uh, brought up and I want to just give one quick update on uh, an item mentioned for the trail. And uh, Steve Wolganot, uh, newly elected to the Matamidae uh, City Council, I believe he's down under now in uh, Australia, otherwise <coughs> he's here in spirit. But uh, he and as well as Mike Brooks, who's co-chairing that group from Wayfair Lake, they have a meeting scheduled for next Wednesday I, it may be right here or else it's, it's in the at the school district, school district. in the community uh, head uh, area. But they're going to be talking about you know various parts of the Lake Links Trail. And uh, as many of you know, we were able to get some funding to continue the planning for that trail. Uh, they're looking at details now on configurations for parts of it. Uh, <laughs> lots of details. We won't get into all of that, but to let you know that's very much in a planning action stage right now and there's the meeting that's coming up next Wednesday and they also have a very uh, robust website uh, for Lake Links that will give you additional updates on that so we're looking at proposed legislation that will further advance that but we want to make sure it's in, in consensus with what the neighbors are saying as well we know there's some sensitive issues that are being worked out and it's all about the process right now yeah, but it's moving along, it's gathering momentum, not dust. And so on that, here. I uh, just want to uh, follow up on the meeting a little bit. The meeting starts at 6 o'clock. Uh, and as uh, Senator Weger uh, mentioned, they're focusing on a lot of uh, trying to come up with what the preferred alternative is in a couple of areas. I do know that uh, White Bear Lake has put in some segments this past year. And so we're really excited about the progress that's happening in that area. So we're looking forward to making sure that this program continues on. It's uh, was one that was started over 20 years ago with planning that involved communities not only uh, Birchwood and White Bear Lake and Monomedi, but Oakdale, Maplewood, etc. It covers quite a large area so you can get from, connect the lakes from going all the way from Stillwater all the way out to the Roseville area. And we're excited about what's happening here. Uh, an item that's been in the news uh, almost every day, most recently, uh, uh, legislative was uh, hearing talked about the inexcusable delays that are happening for the processing of the uh, license plates yeah. and yeah. Uh, you know the Minlars system for Minnesota licensing uh, registration and I, I, I'm sure it was never intended you know this has been in process for almost 10 years to get a comprehensive registration program in place but the bottom line is it's not working yet and uh, it's there's been some minor improvements to auto dealers you know, talked about a turnaround that's faster, but uh, it is not at the point where we want. There's nearly a hundred million dollar investment of our dollars, and uh, we are not uh, trying to uh, condone any of the delays. Uh, that needs to get fixed. There's been some changes in personnel, and I can assure you it's a high priority by the administration 
uh, to get this fixed, to get it right. If you are, and, and in fact, I even have a, a license a tab I'm waiting for uh, on a car, but hey, that, that's not a, a problem. You know, it will happen eventually. But for those people where it, there's been a financial ramification and some hardship, and that has been happening, it needs to get fixed. It will, but uh, you know, we know it's uh, very much on your mind. Has anyone been personally affected by this in terms of you know delays? Etc. So, you know, if there's uh, any particular item that you'd like to follow up with us on, get a hold of us in each of our office. But we're we're very aware of it. There's a lot of transparency you know, in terms of what's going on. There's supposed to be a plan, a roadmap that's going to get us out of this, and the you know, the patience is growing thin on that. It's overdue but it's uh, very high on our radar and it, it will get fixed. And another item too that's been in the news that uh, is, just really has a chilling impact is the lack of a timely response for complaints uh, for elderly. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the Star Tribune did a rather uh, deep dive in terms of problems and that could happen to any family or any person and the allegation uh, that a complaint may have just been tossed aside and uh, you know there's family there's uh, you know, a human face behind any of that uh, for those of us that have but well, we're all aging but for those of us that may have relatives that are more advanced Nancy's mother I think, is about 100 years old. 100. 100. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, and she can share stories too, where I'm sure you know, the caregivers, they're, they're doing their best, but that's not always at the optimal level. And <clears throat> this has a great deal of attention as well. There's already been a resignation uh, you know, by, the, uh, you know, by, the, by a commissioner. Uh, there's you know, a great deal that's in place. Uh, I, you know, this is not a partisan issue. This just needs to get done, and to make sure that the staffing and that there's a prompt, you know, investigation and all of the we can have bill of rights and various safeguards and in, in statute, but if it's not being followed, then it's got to get corrected. So, you know, those are a couple of items that have been in the news, and I want to give you the reassurance that uh, we want to get that resolved uh, on the. Uh, elder abuse issue, ARP. Anybody a member of ARP? I, I don't you, you can be. Yeah, that's good. Someday, yes. Uh, and I'm sure they have an auxiliary membership. <laughs> but uh, ARP uh, is working with a task force on this. They're going to come up with recommendations. Uh, and on the uh, 26th, I believe, of uh, this month, Mary George, who is uh, uh, one of the staffers, is uh, working on this. And if you know of a particular situation or have a, a recommendation that you want to make, uh, go right to ARP. Uh, you can go via our office as well if you'd like, but we want to make sure that it's corrected. So uh, those a couple of items that have been in the news and then on the delay, I wanted to mention it. And I thank you for your work for the Department of Revenue and being conscientious about that you know as a public servant and and this will get right eventually in the uh, Department of Public Safety and with our uh, technology professionals I know it's very frustrating for so many of the the workers that are not seeing it that thousands of titles are processed every day but there's just a whole lot more that needs to be the system will get corrected and if it uh, if there's not a roadmap that's going to get us there soon even more change will, will need to be made. So, uh, here, would you like to amplify further on other topics? We'll right. go back and forth, and then we'll open it up again as well on some items. And also, uh, we're so pleased, so many public officials are here as well at the local levels. And if you want to add an additional perspective on any of these uh, issues, please do. I do. Okay. You want to add one? Yes. Uh, for, again, uh, for this is. Mayor Emerson. Oh, for the cities that have license bureaus, our overtime costs, are our budget's taking a hit because 
we didn't have all this budgeted in and now there's large amounts of money we're spending because our our staff is working overtime so that's going to be a, a, a fallout from this whole thing too we have a bill that's being introduced in the house that i've signed on to as a co-author uh, okay. and a similar version is going through the senate is asking for us to for the state to reimburse the licensing bureaus for their what extra costs they run into that because we you know it's an error on the state side i feel very strong with that as a state we should be covering those costs perfect Thank i believe i've represented hansen's yes carry that Representative in the Hansen's senate here, yeah. uh i believe senator newman indicated uh, who's the chair of the transportation okay. indicated that in the hearing uh and so i would imagine it's good should do well uh, if we're looking at a budget deficit of course uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll add to the challenge but it, it's not your <coughs> fault that you're having to do overtime they're doing overtime at the department of public mm -hmm. safety others right now too as we're here mm -hmm. they're working and trying to clear yeah. out the congestion uh early i really appreciate that that you're bringing something forward about that that's the financial piece of it there's also the personal side of it yeah, that well, it's not just you know, it, it, it's the staff, the tension, yes. uh, oh, the frustration, the burnout, the long hours uh, that people are experiencing and going to get your license renewed. And of course, uh, Maplewood has a licensing tips. bureau. Yeah. Right, yeah. Maplewood yeah. does too. It, it, right, that's why I'm speaking about this, that there's that personal side of it that uh, it has been very frustrating for our staff and for our citizens and for community members that come in and expect that there will, there will be the efficiencies that there have been in the past and it is a tense place. It is not a pleasant yeah. place no, to go to today. Changed. Yeah, it has changed complexion completely. Peter. Sure. Uh, one of the things that I know that uh, I heard uh, mentioned was uh, concerns about salt and chloride. Uh, there have been some articles that have been out over the, you know, uh, over the last uh, couple months letting people know some of what the cities are doing. Uh, for those that are not aware of, what is happening is because of the uh, primary because of the salt use that we have in our state for not only roads but for water softeners we have problems with a lot of uh, chloride content rising in our lakes and in a number of area wells and as a result what that does is in some areas it's starting to pass the threshold will start having an impact on aquatic life and so as a result we're working very hard looking for new ways to try to make sure that we're addressing the problem of keeping chlorides out but also figuring out what are different methods that we can use for applying salt on our roads? And I think some of the things that people may recall seeing is that in the past, it was always, you know, I used to see just the trucks full of salt just dumping it out. Now I'm seeing where they're pre-treating the roads before with a brine mixture, which cuts down substantially on their salt usage. And so there's different things like that. I know that there's a project going on that's looking at using beet juice uh, to try to address some of these kind of things. But the other big thing that is a huge contributor besides road salt, the other big contributor is water softeners in the home. Water softeners, because you're using salt and chloride in the process, that is what is, and in many of our smaller communities, this is the number one reason that's contributing their problem, is the water softeners in the salt homes and the salt being used. And so what we need to find out are ways that we can address that part of the problem. Here locally, many of the communities that we have in our area, when their water comes to us through the public system, their water is soft enough that you don't need to soften it any farther. You really don't need that uh, water softener. Uh, I know that where I am in Maplewood, and we're, on, we're the part of Maplewood that gets the water from North St. Paul Wells, we haven't used a water softener in years and find out that everything works just as well. Uh, St. Paul Water Utility is the same way. And if I remember right, right I think we, we, you, we, you, you guys are yeah, yeah, yeah. taking care of that in their area. Because when we find out, once the salt is in the water, it's extremely expensive to get out. It's cheaper to find out ways not to get it in in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so that is an area that we've been focusing on. I know that uh, the folks on the Public Safety Transportation Committee, that's one of their things that they look at. I know that I serve on the Environment Committee in the House. It's something that we're also keeping an eye on. Plus, Senator Weir and I are on the Legislative Water Commission. And this is an area that over the past couple of months, we've been hearing about as part of wastewater treatment is figuring out how do we deal with the chloride problem that's out there because it is becoming a bigger issue. And we need to start figuring out ways to address it. Now, it's not a crisis, but if we don't do anything, it will be a crisis. So those are one of the things I'm working on. So I, I appreciate you asking about that. And I, I don't know if any of the cities have anything else they'd like to add on the... Uh, I guess the only thing I would say is I think um, in terms of technology, most of the trucks that are used by municipalities and Mendette, of course, the calibrations for salt application 
it's they they're so careful about they look at temperature weather conditions never nevertheless we still see a lot being dumped out but it's really a balance between the use of that salt and then try to make sure that people are safe on the roads and expectations about what is that level of safety so we have to decide where to land on that i think a third component uh, in addition to what cities and what mindat put on the roads and then the water softeners i think too one thing to take a look at is what's happening out there on uh, private uh, parking lots if you look at any private parking lot today they are white uh -huh. uh, yeah. because i think a lot of companies just go and throw out lots and lots of salt and i think that that's a third component that i'd like you to uh, consider and residential and residential yeah, homes. yeah. Homes. but be, being put out there uh, not by the public sector but by uh, you know, private companies that are taking care of parking lots and and um, yeah. thank you for, for mentioning that that's one of the things that we have got it the state's got a program that they've put in place for a certification process that when uh, and it's open not only to communities but also <coughs> to private contractors so they can come in and go through the certification process and when they go through that they receive a certificate and as long as they're following the process it helps also provide legal liability legal protections for them as as they're going through the process is that voluntary or mandatory it's right now it's voluntary it's not mandatory yeah, yeah, yeah. so and that's but it, it's also an education process There's a lot of folks are, this is something that's been very much newer in the last couple of years and so right now we're also trying to focus on getting the word out there and working through different programs to do that uh, yeah, I was just going to mention that, Peter. Uh, Fortin Consulting, F-O-R-T-I-N, is the um, yes. consultant that's been doing those trainings across the state. So if you want to check out their information on the website, best practices and salt application. Uh, but I was also going to say, Montevita has been a leader in this issue, one of the first cities to uh, establish the brine solution mm -hmm. that uh, was mentioned. And, and they actually supply brine for many of the surrounding cities. Yep. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. On the water issue, uh, we probably haven't had a good look unless you're ice fishing or something at the lake and uh, but you know, there was a major lawsuit that was uh, decided by Judge Marinan and Ramsey uh, District Court uh, that was brought by uh, Lakeshore owners primarily the Mantle area and the court had put in some pretty strong restrictions regarding uh, what can can't be done what the lake level should be etc and you know the bottom line is that uh, will in this area though this is all subject to an appeal mm -hmm. and it's going to be heard I believe January 26 uh, by the same judge who's coming out of retirement but <laughs> that's usually what happens so it should be no surprise what her decision will be but that's a process but the DNR is appealing uh, some of the restrictions and the impact it could have for local government, but it can impact everyone, and some are okay, some are concerned, uh, but you know, in terms of uh, lawn sprinkling bans and other efforts to conserve uh, water, uh, particularly for you know residential, the impact on commercial is not as clear as to what those ramifications are going to be, but we are looking at a number of additional requirements yeah and you know so that the lake level can be at a, a sustainable amount and actually you, there's a website where you can you know, check that lake level every day and but the court has prescribed uh, recommendations on that there uh, within a five mile radius of the lake there will be a, a number of additional expectations uh, for those communities now that uh, have their water you know, through pumping through the well and will sell that um, that may not be the case a generation from now uh, you know this one uh, you know, there because of the impact that it has on the aquifer and by pumping that out and it will impact the ability of that lake level uh, to be at a sustainable level so without getting too deep into uh, the water on that to let you know that you know, it's in court uh, suggestions that we've talked about in the past to augment or pipe water in probably aren't going to be on the table during this legislative session uh, we're going to be you know reviewing what the court said and even during an appeals <coughs> 
process, there's a number of items can be done. Uh, I, I salute the school children and uh, the White Bear and Matamidi schools and elementary, and several that have volunteered through the Race to Reduce. They're learning about water conservation and, uh, and the next generation, that's essential to do. Um, but it's in court right now and uh, I think I'll, I'll ask you know, either uh, well, any of you that would like to comment further, but uh, Mayor Emerson, who's also the uh, new president of the League of Cities, has a number of hats on this, and uh, maybe you for, for residents, if you'd like to, to share what your thinking is at this point. Well, I think I, I think you you've described it very accurately. I don't really have much to add to it, but yes, I mean it is in the appeal process, and then we will see where it goes from there. Uh, some of the restrictions, as, as Senator Weger mentioned, I mean, they want a 30% reduction in municipal water usage based on your 2016 rates. Well, when we've already reduced ours by 25%, how do we go down another 30%? That's pretty draconian. Mm -hmm. How are we, you know? Yeah, it's a very good point. It, you know, our area is reducing yeah. its so usage, and hard. I have a new uh, uh, item that's going to be coming out, just an update. And I asked them at council to just show that we are monitoring that. We want to get a better handle on this uh, consumption that's being done. And so, you know, there was some incentive money that went to various areas. And uh, I was just in a meeting this week uh, with the Met Council and others. And yes, we are reducing mm -hmm. water consumption. Uh, but, but like, you know, another 30%. Yeah. I don't know of any municipality that's going to be it. Unless they've done none, then they possibly can make that quota. But I don't know of any municipality or in the five-mile area that's going to be able to meet that. So that's kind of where we're at. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, Commissioner Karlowski. If I could just piggyback off, it's good timing with all the talk about the water and the chloride. Um, I, uh, we have, I think we really try to do a good job in Washington County to protect that resource. And I go to the water consortium, and just last on Monday we uh, it was on Monday we had a tour of a water treatment plant, and within uh, very short hours they have the water sewage treated to the point of it can be discharged safely into the sink. All right, it's amazing, but they can't get the chlorides out of the water. So one of the things that so what with the thought of moving forward would be is to use that treated water to use in agricultural applications to use in factories and commercial industrial mm -hmm. so if we could make that leap in technology to get the chlorides out we could recycle that water before it goes, gets into our uh, it would be better not to put it in a mm -hmm. St. Croix even though it's probably cleaner water in St. Croix it's not drinkable but we can preserve our groundwater tables by recycling that water so really on the chloride, if we could make a step in technology, and maybe that's where the legislature could invest study time. But if you okay. use it in agriculture, eventually it's gonna get back into the system anyway. It's gonna yeah. get into the ground. It's gonna kill the soil. Yeah. Right. But, I think the but, but you can't take chloride out because it's really cost, too cost effective, I mean, yeah. cost ineffective to do it because chloride is such a primary chemical. You yeah. can't get it out. It, it connects to everything and you can't get it out of the water without yeah. contaminating whatever you're taking it out with. Yeah, it's, it's just too cost, cost ineffective. I, I'm in water treatment and okay. it's just, it's, you just can't do it. But if we could get to use it in a commercial industrial setting. They, uh, have, they have salt standards too. Yeah, but the commercial industry does lose a lot of, use a lot of water, so and well, they, thank you. They need clean water as well. Yeah. There's meetings almost every day on the subject, and so you know, to the extent you and I do see uh, you know, some of you at these meetings from time to time. So, uh, for any particular follow-up, uh, we'll be in touch on that. Reverse osmosis is about the only way you can do it, and that's really, really expensive. Thank you. Okay. Uh, here. Uh, next thing is uh, some depending what news channels you've been watching over the last week or so. Some have been doing some articles about mental health. Uh, issues, uh, particularly about capacity within the system. Uh, that is a, uh, in some ways that's a good problem that we're having. And where I'm coming from that is I've, I work in a homeless youth population. I've been working with them for the last 10 years. 
And 10 years ago, when we first used to talk about mental health, and we saw people that were having mental health issues, very few of the people that we were dealing with, which was representative society, would ever go to get help because there was such a stigma attached to people who had mental health issues. And people with mental health illnesses, many times it's not much any, it's not any different than somebody who's got diabetes or who's got cancers, etc. As long as you get the treatment and you take care of it, you're able to operate without any problems. But if it's like a cut you have that you don't take care of, a cut can get infected and eventually you can lose your arm or your leg. And the same thing with mental health. If you don't get that treatment, it can fester and get worse. So the good thing is, is that over the years, as a society, we've said that instead of just looking at physical health and mental health, we've brought it together. Uh, here in the state of Minnesota, we've been one of those saying that mental health is just as important as physical health and people should have the opportunity to be able to have treatments available for them. At the same time as we've been doing that, perceptions in our communities are, which is a good thing, is slowly changing that it does not carry the stigma in a number of areas that it used to. There are some communities where it still has a large stigma issue. But what's great is because people are feeling that stigma being removed, that it's not a pariah to be able to say that you've had mental health issues. We're seeing more and more people realizing that I need help and they're out seeking. And what is good is because of the Affordable Care Act, that's one of the things that also in our state that we required, that the providers also have to provide mental health coverage. The good news is people are now seeking help and being able to get the help they need. The downside is, is that we're having more people come into the system than we've got providers right now. And that's some of the problems that we're experiencing is that there's been such a good change in how people are, are viewing uh, mental health issues that they're not getting treatment. The problem is we've not been able to have the uptick yet catch up in the providers that are out there. And so that is causing a problem and we are looking into it. I know that Health and Human Services Committee, I serve on that in the House. We've been talking about that over the past year. It'll be something that'll be coming up again this year try to look for ways to try to provide, provide more capacity in the system quicker. Uh, and that's going to be an important thing. And, and part of it too is some of it has been the funding of where the state has provided resources in the past when people have had severe mental health issues. Some of the systems that are needed to be in place for treatment and beds available have not always kept up with that. That is a function of state government. That's one of the things that drives our budget here in the state. We're going to have to make more of a financial commitment to how we start cracking that problem because right now I've known people who've had severe mental health issues here in, this, in our local area where when they've had to go treatment they've had to go up to Lindstrom up to northern Minnesota some of them had had, had to go to other states because we did not have any open beds to take care of them so we do have a problem out there and so we are we are aware of it we're working on unfortunately we don't have all of the answers right now and part of it is a capacity system as people are trained as more people go into the field, some of that will start resolving itself over the next couple of years. Unfortunately, there's not a real quick individual fix that we can just throw out there right now uh, because part of it is related to a capacity issue. And does that training gonna go also to the police forces because they seem to uh, be too aggressive with mentally incapacitated people and it's very disappointing. I, I can tell you that I know a lot of our local communities, I know White Bear Lake's been involved with this, uh, uh, Maplewood have been involved with this, is where they are spending much more time and training on it. I can tell you that uh, we're located in North Minneapolis, and how I've seen the police department respond over the years <coughs> is I've seen the improvement in the training. And when they come when we've had somebody who's in mental health crisis to our facility, how they have improved greatly. We're not perfect, we're not where we need to be because we're dealing with large numbers that have to go through training and it just takes a long time. But I am seeing upticks there. Um, I don't know if you folks might. Yeah, like I can it. say that um, at least with our officers, we have some training that they're rotating through. It's a three, four day intensive um, mental health training and interacting with um, residents and also use of force and how you manage that. Um, it's also a lot of focus, especially over the past few years, I think, with all of the um, departments statewide, but, um, you know, I can only speak for our own, but I know that's been a significant issue. Uh, and, go ahead, Kelly. Uh, one of the, from the school side, yes. we see a lot of need in this area. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and depression, but actually more so than depression in our schools, anxiety. Mm -hmm. That's really the <coughs> issue. And it starts in the elementary schools. 
And I know there was some additional funding, I think it's running out this year, mm -hmm. to help put some more resources in. So I would advocate, let's make sure we renew that. <coughs> But we need to renew that and add because we just are not able to take care of all of the needs that we have. And I think the idea of working with the students when they're young will help so that when they come out of the schools, they don't have the issues, right? So um, it's kind of like that little slogan I saw on the billboard by the prison. Lionel Lake's prison pay us now or pay us later. I guess. <laughs> um, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about the schools. So my son, who's nine, has autism and has done a lot of and, uh, You can project a little bit louder. You're oh, sorry. My son has autism. He's nine years old. And he goes to St. Jerome's and he goes to Edgerton Elementary. And he has um, autism, anxiety, and ADHD. He has been dismissed from public school for five times in December. Um, because of he's dysregulated and um, I'm sharing that with you because we have to do a better job combining mental health with schools teachers cannot teach students if their mental health is not taken care of and that goes um, it goes even broader if a student comes and is hungry then you're not going to be able to teach a student or a, a child who's hungry if a child comes in dysregulated, you have to deal with the mental health first, and then you can go to the education level. And teachers are not psychologists or psychiatrists or social workers. Um, and so it's something that um, I think teachers are seeing it younger and younger in elementary schools. It's a huge, huge deal. Um, I also am a parent who has done a lot of um, legislative stuff with TEFRA because for my child, he was not able, with his regular health Tell insurance. Tell me what TEFRA is. TEFRA is, if you have a child that's deemed having a disability, um, you can access it. But it is a sliding scale based on the parent's income. So we're a middle class income. My husband works for 3M in Maplewood. Um, we were not able to get the medically necessary therapies so we had to go on it when our child was two now our child is nine and we are greatly financially affected by it um, you have school districts who have children that qualify you know for this service but the parents simply will not do it because of the cost so then the school districts have to do it all by themselves without the me without the uh, <laughs> medical side and that's unfair to school districts as well um, but I think it is a huge huge issue um, I really believe in, in inclusion um, and I think that we have some work to do and I don't have all the answers but I, I share it because I love my principal Melissa at Edgerton I absolutely love her and we're doing a lot of work together. Um, but we need to have more training and we need to have more options. Thank you. Um, well, I, I, on the public safety issue, and I want to share, I, I've known Carol Bufton for almost 40 years, and you never know I'm looking at Carol. She's in you have lived in uh, Montevideo all those years too, but uh, right after I graduated law school, uh, I worked for the Minnesota Medical Association, and one of the first priorities that the physicians had was uh, child passenger uh, safety, just that you know so many kids were being you know, killed and injured, and uh, Carol was there. Uh, chief exec of the Minnesota Safety Council for many years mm -hmm. and retired a few years ago but uh, we formed an alliance with the uh, physicians and the Safety Council uh, back then on child passenger restraints and at that point there weren't any requirements uh, you know and you know you just you know hoped you know there was the argument that you know the government should tell you, you know, how to raise your kid you know in the car and so you know it was controversial as to whether there should be a child passenger restraint now you would think of you know traveling with your 
you know, loved ones or any kids unless you had that protection. But that's when we, we first met and working on that and that was my first project and so it was a real feel good to see that after a couple of years eventually get passed. So thanks for your work uh, throughout the years and uh, just overall I want to say that the, uh, Minnesota, I believe the traffic fatalities hit a, 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 almost an all time low or close to it this year. year. And so that is very good news. And uh, I want to tell you one thing, though, there was a deer that uh, towed my car off <laughs> last week, and, uh, but nothing that could have been done about that. So. They don't respond well to education. Yes. <laughs> but uh, in any event, no, I'm just thinking about that event now. Okay. In, in turn, so we're very pleased about the progress that is being made in terms of the uh, big reduction. And you know, there's a number of you know, uh, laws that are in place that have been done. It is making an impact. Can we do more? Uh, yes. Uh, I, I don't know for this upcoming session. Uh, you know, we'll review you know policies as you know, uh, Peter said. But uh, you know, we, we do look at bottom line in terms of you know what is that accident mortality rate and get input from others and so I was pleased to get that uh, recent information. Continuing the public information campaigns is important and again the Minnesota Safety Council has an awesome website with lots of information as well as a MnDOT and, and other groups so uh, I'd, I'd like though if we could to go to education uh, because that is our future in terms of you know a, a state and uh, the next generation or the retraining and what we do and if, if I could uh, you know, Angelia could if, if you'd like to just give a, a few words on Century you know one of the area's largest employers uh, uh, and you know sort of the economic engine of you know trading and you work with you know the hospitals you work with 3M you work with our fire departments you, you're training our area uh, workforce, your retraining, etc., and and then maybe just a, a few words from some of the school board members that they'd like and anyone else because this is the biggest part of our state budget. It's in education and training, and for good reason. So, yes, uh, Senator always does this to me <laughs> when I come to his meetings. <laughs> but uh, thank you for the the highlight. Yes, yeah, Century is um, an economic engine and education is clearly um, at the forefront. We have been partnering with uh, many of um, the companies in this area to uh, retrain uh, incumbent workers, to bring uh, courses and courseware on site for uh, companies to um, train employees closer to their location. Um, we have uh, partnered with companies for internships, apprenticeship, um, opportunities, clinicals at the hospital for our nursing and medical assisting programs. But I have to tell everyone this, if we're going to address the scales gap in our region, we have to do more. We have to scale it. We have to make our uh, efforts intentional. It has to be part of our work rather than a conversation about what we're going to do. Um, it needs to be built into the infrastructure that when there is a century or an educational institution and there's business and industry, it is apparent that we're going to work together. It's essential that we're going to work together because the other thing that I'm concerned about is we have uh, to get to those students prior to getting to the point that they're going to the next step. Um, and we're working on that with White Bear Lake Chamber, Vadness Heights, and, and many of our, our chambers and K-12 through partners where we can get this career and information to them so that they are on track to be viable in the marketplace based on the education that we receive. Other than that, we will have a lot of students with loan debt for degrees that they can't use. And how do we continue to make that uh, viable? So we want to make sure that uh, we're channeling our educational efforts 
toward um, and giving students the vi valuable education that they need, whether that's liberal arts and, and sciences to go on to four-year universities, or whether those are workforce skills uh, where they can get in the market. But um, we have been doing a lot of work at Century. We are excited about continuing that work and building even more valuable partnerships uh, than we have right now. And what I want to say in closing is that we are the best option. Students who go to a uh, century uh, mature within their first <coughs> two years of college or three years at times, they are a stronger student when they transfer um, and they are more uh, channeled and focused and purposeful. They transfer students after going to a community college. <laughs> Representative I graduated. I know office. you did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tend to complete at higher levels. And, is, and uh, universities will tell you that. Um, so what we would rather do is more students start with that financial base. And our tuition is affordable at the two-year level. And we are able to reduce some of that loan debt that is in the market. So we don't want a century to be the best kept secret anymore. We want to be a household name and a household resource um, at many levels and as well as at business and industry. So thank you always, Senator, for asking me to speak. Did anyone here attend century? Okay, uh, and does awesome. anyone have a family member or relative that? <coughs> or another community college. Or other community I will forgive you. <laughs> and if you'd like to introduce yourself, so you yeah. came here to talk uh, to, with a question and interest in education retraining. So yeah. if you'd like. Yeah. Yes, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about that. Uh, my name is Samia. I am a career services uh, professional. Um, and my basically, my interest is education and training. Um, Where do you live? I live in Maplewood. Yeah, okay, good. We shared that with everybody. Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, I live in Maplewood, and I have two children um, who are in elementary school. And education is very important to me and my family. Um, so as a prof um, career services professional person, um, I see that you know, having education and some trainings while in while our students are in high school is very um, critical because some students, when I, I've worked with um, some high school students and I've seen that some high school students, when they graduate, they're not interested in going to college right away. And that's okay because not everybody wants to go to college right away. However, we do understand that education is important, but we cannot force certain students if they don't want to go to college. But what we can do is educate those students and giving them some resources and getting some type of training to help them. At least if they don't want to go to college, they can still get paid a decent amount of money and also have some type of hands-on training. Um, not all the high schools actually have those resources, so I would like to see many high schools in Minnesota um, having career coaches and coaching those students and having some training on certifications. I know Central College and Central College do have some certifications, which is great. But I would like to see some tie with the community colleges, tie with high schools, to see how we can better those students who don't want to go to college, to give them some support um, in those areas. But working with the high schools, and yeah. I know we're working on that, and we can always <coughs> improve in everything we do. Yeah. So mm -hmm. yeah. the challenge is but uh, with the White Bear and Mount Vita, I, North St. Paul, Maplewood, I, I know there's the ongoing dialogues, but we gotta continue that. Yeah. And there's also, I, and I also know there's other programs that are being piloted out. I know working with the unions, some of the unions are working yeah. with some of the local school districts where you're working with the trades, where the trades are coming yeah. in, yeah. And bringing those, so what we used to call out of job training when we were growing up, yes. it, it kind of went away a little bit, and this is a way that's trying to come in to show people that there are these other great opportunities and giving them those skills, and that's yes. something that has come from both the Senate and the House. Yes, and also it would be nice to see our high school students, because we have a lot of bright students in high schools, um, that I can essentially can get their some um, maybe two-year degree while they're still in high school. Yeah. That can really happen. So I would like to see a lot of that um, resources because not many students have those resources. I think that will be yeah. very helpful. Yeah. 
Uh, Jessica, and then I guess. Okay. Um, and I, I want to piggyback on that. I think another element of high school education, any at level of education is also their participation in civic life. Um, and so the, currently the world's best workforce legislation includes preparation for college and career, but there isn't an element for civic life. And yes. no matter what <laughs> students do, whether they go to college, whether they go into a career, they are going to participate in civic life. And so I would really like to see that added to the world's best workforce legislation um, so that kids know that Yes, they vote, but there are so many things like come to town hall meetings, you know, <laughs> and things like that. So that's something that I would really like to see. I also am concerned, um, as you say, that education is the number one thing in the budget. Well, if there's a shortfall, I really want to make sure that it doesn't come out of education, especially seeing last year some of the proposals that were coming out that were taking money away from the school districts. And eventually that didn't happen, but I really want to make sure that the money stays where it is and increases for our school districts. So we can do things like more career and also more civic life. Mm -hmm. Thanks. On civics, uh, you're very modest. Uh, you did also share she's uh, in charge of you know, training teachers with for the Minnesota Historical Thanks, Society. She works at that beautiful mm -hmm. uh, facility downtown uh, St. Paul, but uh, that's her passion on civics and has a great deal to share. So thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, in the back, and then we'll get to Great. Hi. Um, we are trying to reinvent the wheel as far as education goes. Back 30, 40 years ago, Lakewood College was sitting there, and we also had a Bowtech program yes. where kids did not have to take an English class, a certain type, they would get their math class if they needed it in their Votech program. They did not have to take the time to spend over at the other college now. We've changed that. Now we do not have a separate Votech. Okay, we also have a program now where we used to have shop classes for kids in school where they worked on motors, all these things. And they, they don't do that anymore. I've got a good friend that's an engineer. He went to shop class, and from there, he went to um, St. Paul Tech. And he makes a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, you don't have to necessarily have. We push this idea. When we talk about anxiety, pressure. We put pressure on our kids every day. Our society does this. We do not have to reinvent the wheel. I think we need to let people take the path, we need to give them the path to the education, to the career they want. And I don't think we should throw, uh, you know, things in their way necessarily, because kids will say, well, I'd like to be a plumber, but I don't want to go to Lakewood or Century now because I've got to take blah, blah, blah classes before I do that. You know, we need, Montemita does a great job with their STEM program and all these things, introducing it at a very young age. Otter Lake does a great job in White Bear. We, you know, but you need participation, and you need the kids to feel, you know, you, you get them at, like you said, get them involved at a young age, but let them do these things. So, uh, I totally agree with you. Yeah. And there should be a realistic pathway for a student to achieve their dream. Right. And we should not send out the wrong signals or detours mm -hmm. if it is going to get them in the way of that ultimate pathway to success. And there is a transformation that is going on right now to do that okay. in terms of expectations for requirements. Uh, it's being built in for counselors to encourage students to go into uh, the trades, for example. Um, if you don't get my e-newsletter, uh, make sure you sign in, by the way. And that's, it's free, by the way. <laughs> the e—that was a joke, Mary. <laughs> the e-newsletter that we just sent out talked about higher ed, but it talked too about the pathway in VoTech in careers. For free, you can be uh, get a very good job as a sheet metal worker or an electrician, pipe fitter. The trade schools, in partnership with labor and business, you know this. If you have the aptitude and the attitude. Right. They will train you, and those opportunities need to be uh, shouted out more. Uh, you know, with the White Bear, uh, you know, the local part of their schools, with Don Mullen on the school board, and working so actively in these partnerships. So keep doing this, and 
it's a more effective way. And by the way, these jobs uh, pay very good. They have pensions. And so I, I think you know, more and more uh, you know, parents and uh, others are encouraging you know, their, their kids or even re-examining their own careers as to that. So agree. And, and we're going to have to adjourn in just a couple of minutes, but there will be other opportunities too. And yes, I agree sir. with you, Senator, and that's where educational partners can work with those companies to develop that curriculum that could be uh, delivered there. And, and to your point, the part of Lakewood is um, the career to Bo Tech um, that was 916 is still part of Century. Yeah. We still have many, many career and vocational programs that do not require the um, 101. It's the language and the communication are more contextualized based on what that career needs because what we hear from business and industry is that those communication skills and those critical thinking skills that come through those liberal arts classes those civic engagement type skills and and socializational skills uh, socialization skills are still very important so there's still a place for that in our curriculum so if, whether they get it at the point of entry in that job they're going to have to back out and get it at some point because the the employers are saying they still need it. But so can I ahead. say one thing? My husband worked at a manufacturing company, the CFO. He would see people come in that couldn't read a ruler. Okay? And there this is just a plain manufacturing job. It's pretty simple. They couldn't read a ruler. My God, they should have that when they're six or eight years old. They should be able to read a ruler. We are failing them not by saying we are failing them in the grade school and the high school. That's where we're failing them. I mean, Minnesota is ranked, I believe, 40th in state education for education right now. Is it not? Um, no, well, there might, depending on. Well, I think I read what recently. You're looking at, but there's a number of indicators where it's okay. Much higher. But my point is. We, we spend a lot of money on education, but we don't seem to get the results <coughs> that we should be getting. Okay. Uh, Commissioner, okay. that would be the last uh, question that we have. To One of my on. assignments on serving on the county board is I signed to the Workforce Development Board. Mm -hmm. And this week we met with all the superintendents, uh, Mark Nelson, I believe, mm -hmm. and the assistant from White Bear Lake, Sarah. Mm -hmm. and because at a county level we want to keep people gainfully employed for they, they don't go on public services and also in Washington County we have great ability here to grow uh, our tax base by good businesses and then you know keep the pressure off the property taxes and so we are trying to do as a workforce development board it's a board of businesses and educators we're trying to support those career pathways. For that, everybody has to go to a four-year college so people can go to Century for a year or two. There are job. we want to grow businesses in Washington County. And uh, so we're trying to do our part as a county role on that career pathways. Not everybody has to go to a four-year college. Great if they do. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, um, we're going to need to stop right now. We'll be around for a little bit where we can continue dialogue. Uh, thank you for giving us your most valuable gift, your time, and for the honor of representing you. Uh, if you want to be on our e-newsletter update or you want to sign in, please do if you didn't. And also, if you would like, we're going to just take a group picture. It's not for partisan purpose or anything like that. It might go on Facebook or something, but uh, we're going to do that in 30 seconds. So that will be available. And in Dallas, it said that there's a video that might be shown. Uh, uh, YouTube.com YouTube uh, YouTube YouTube slash yeah. our star away. So, thank you for sharing that. So, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, John Marsh, for uh, <laughs> making uh, all available.